so yeah, my name's uh, Alison Park, and I'm part of the Cloud Savings and Spooning Design Studio in London. Um, we come from a background in architecture, but um, we're kind of badly behaved architects um, in quite a lot of different ways. The cool thing about uh, coming to WeShow is I don't have to stand up and talk about the Industrial Revolution, the Paris Republic stuff, because you'll get this stuff, right? You will know this. The interesting stuff we have to interrogate is where exactly is the disruption? And actually, while we should reject technological determinism, we also have to understand that these massive social and cultural changes in our mindsets came through quite mundane technologies, which we'll come back to. Um, okay. So, yeah, we seem to be moving into this. This is the important machine to see, CNC machine. It's a cameras and a 3D printer, but there's more of them, potentially. Um, uh, we seem to be moving into this future where the factory might be everywhere in the next century, which has really, 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 really big implications. Um, it has big implications because you know, one of our favorite quotes is John Maynard Keynes, it's easy to ship recipes in the case of biscuits. That's always been true, but now it's really, really, really true. So the problem is our entire industrial economy doesn't work around that rule. It designs on the idea that you make a recipe, you ship it halfway around the world to wherever you can find the cheapest labor to exploit, and then uh, ship all the, the cakes back again around the world. Um, so sure, yeah, we could be moving into this future where you can design stuff. That in itself is not an industrial revolution. It just means you're going to have a lot of IP battles. Maybe you'll download your iPhone 10, maybe. But, um, uh, in itself, changes logistics, but it's not necessarily an industrial revolution. This potentially is an industrial revolution. We start having the ability to have open source stuff in the same way that there's open source software, you can have open source hardware, kind of thing. Um, and you can just download it and fabricate it. And what these technologies are doing, apart from is democratizing that design team, opening up the design team, is also opening up, fundamentally changing the rules of one size fits all economies in design, in mass manufacturing. You know, this idea that don't, if you want to have a portal, you've got to have one size fits all, it's no longer true. So products and stuff start becoming more like Darwin's finishes, right? Distinct similarities, but adapting to their local conditions and individual needs. Um, so here's the, the thing about mundane, I love this quote, right? Um, first of all, what can ever happen to tin food and food And the more mundane, the more interesting you get, actually. Kind of mundane diffusion technologies. It's not about raising the bar. So the question is not, uh, if you like, the Industrial Revolution, but what's the question we're asking the Industrial Revolution? And the Industrial Revolution is the answer to what kind of question. And I think this is a really, really good question. So I'm going to really give a really kind of quick fire thing to, a quick fire case for why the stuff that we're talking about here um, matters for cities. Um, and I'll hand it a plug-in. You can almost at the click of a switch, you can click make this house. And what it will do is generate a set of cutting files for a CNC machine and able to print out parts. I should have you at this point. The so plug-in does do that. It's kind of still roping. Um, but we've, we've done that. Um, you can then take those cutting files and feed them into one of these CNC machines using a standard sheet material like plywood. And effectively what you're doing is cutting out the parts. And the, from the model, the component names are labeled onto the parts. So you, the designer can have the name system. So it's basically the mother of all our gear sets. And we can make it really, you know, kind of comprehensible. Well, we'll find out on Saturday. If you change the naming system, so it's your fault. Um, <laughs> uh, and then you can take those parts and you lay them out, and you don't need any uh, screws or bolts. We've managed to get that far in development. It just uses wedge and peg connections. Um, and you don't need to be very able bodies. Um, you've got to sort of be able to stand up and lift basic loads. But uh, a team of about two or three people can build a sort of basic house chassis like this in about a day. Uh, really, really quick. Again, <laughs> the proof will be in the pudding on Saturday if you go. It's embarrassing. Um, and then, of course, you've got the basic chassis for the house into which you can start putting other solutions, which we're also wanting to develop. I'll come back to that open solution support. Like cladding and services, which are ultimately more important. Now, of course, once you've got the house, if you've got your CNC, what you've got, of course, is the ability for the house to never be finished. You're combining design and use. Right, you're, you're completely screwing with the rules here, because suddenly the house, if you've got a CNC machine, can make the next house. Um, and you, so you can begin to see what the complete open source development model can look like. So here's a kind of cartoon walkthrough of various different forms of development, what this might mean for urban development. Capital development, you have a big chunk of land, you find one big chunk person with a big chunk of money and a big chunk of finance for the developer, it doesn't matter whether they're state or, or, or private or whatever. Um, and of course what they do is therefore come along and they procure a big chunk of building. 
And that's why most cities look the way they do, by the way, because form follows finance. Um, don't put it down that function. Um, uh, and then what they do is they then get planning application on this big development, which is fine. Uh, often you have a okay, some community protesting with banners, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, they go through a period of construction, they have to pay a full construction cost because they're paying professionals to do everything. And you also have these interesting things where when you've got an inflating market, as you do in most of the major cities, um, of course, there's no real incentive for the way they're making of these property assets. And there's no real incentive for people making property assets, for example, to invest in more insulation in the walls, because they're not paying any bills. So unless you've got a really deeply plastic market, uh, so, sorry, deeply elastic market, um, then that's not going to happen. So there's every incentive for them uh, to just make the ceilings lower, take off the balconies, and so on so forth. All the stuff we're familiar with. Um, and for, what, what do you mean by elastic market? Sorry, uh, a, a market uh, where, which, uh, I'm checking if I'm getting my economics wrong here, right? But uh, a market which responds directly. So if the thing they're making is bad, then demand for it will go down. Right. Okay. right. Um, whereas in inflating property markets, you know, everyone goes, oh, my house is going up in value. What no one says is my next house has got half as big. Um, right, it's just simple. But um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a very amateur economist. So. Um, um, and of course, the thing you end up with is you've got to then find a way to afford these inflated property assets, right? Um, through debt or whatever, you know, whatever the mechanism is, or so social subsidy and so forth. And that's been our um, kind of model for affordability over the, the 1990s and 2000s. So here's an alternative model. Use their development. Instead of selling the land to one person with a lot of money, sell it to many people with a bit of money. Same return. Um, and what they do is they come together and they form, uh, perhaps with local residents, but perhaps just this group, they come together. And what they do is effectively design a set of rules. And we have this on the statute book in the UK, at least. I know it's called the Local Development Order. So instead of applying for a big planning commission, they just come together. They agree a set of rules, like it can only be this high or whatever it might be. So as long as you stay with these rules, you can do what you want. Um, again, yeah, the Dutch are already doing this, right? They're always better. Um, uh, then you pay a company, or perhaps the original owner will pay a basic amount to put in basic core infrastructure into the site, because that is better done by professionals, at least at the moment. Um, and then you will start by coming together, doing community fundraising, and founding a community factory, which is what you'll see in Sea Machine in it. It's also a kind of ideas factory or kind of micro university. And you just go about self building your neighborhood together, right? Um, and of course, you're investing in social capital, so you're just paying the material costs. And as you're saying, if we can lower those thresholds of time, cost, and skill, then we can actually be disruptive. Um, and of course, you've got incentives, therefore, to invest in that place as a place to live, to bring up your kids, to pay the easy bills, and so forth. And of course, at the end of it, you've got this factory, right? Which is exactly the stuff we're talking about Fab Labs, education places um, in, in every community. And of course, once you do it once, you can then completely share, not just, if you like, the, the hardware costs, but if you like, the full costing and development models. So we can start to get really into this stuff around certification. How can we make platforms that also lower the thresholds of like certification? Um, and this isn't new. This is not in any way innovative. It's actually how we built places for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it's just inhibited the scale, right? The difference, you know, open source is effectively vernacular with a web connection. Um, so, Actually, what we're doing is unlocking this capability, but actually it requires some technical disruptions to do this. Because if I say to my friend, look, can you come and help me build a house for a month? They're kind of like, no, I'm actually I'm busy. But if I say, can you come and help me for a weekend, because I've got the system that enables us to do that, they're like, yeah, that sounds like more fun than going to all towers. So, um, that's kind of interesting thing. Um, and so where are we at as a project? Uh, yes, we're, we're basically much more than people think we are. Uh, we've been tinkering around for about a year and a half, and we've got these kind of groups popping up uh, around the place doing all kinds of different things. It's, you, you guys got on and mentioned at the last minute there for making one, um, and, and in various different ways. And yeah, so we, what we've done is we've built loads of structural prototypes. So we've gone from a kind of idea to some kind of proof in the sense that we've shown that we can make these structures and that they work, and we can take all that complexity off the table in pieces so you can just stop these things together. Um, Every time someone does it, I don't know, we weren't there at this occasion. Every time someone does it, they do it in a different order than us, and it's probably better. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and so this is kind of where we're at. We're saying less further on than we are. We've gone from 
from a kind of a start point to a kind of proof of concept. But actually, what we're trying to do now is close the first circle for a minimum wealth product, which is first completed house, which is actually a fully lived in powered house with um, padding systems and so forth, delivered at cost with all the cost of the shares. So that's our kind of big, one of our big goals for this year. Um, getting the plug in a little bit better. Platform-wise, software, we're doing okay, actually, uh, ahead of other things, but um, frankly, we're doing the whole thing on a shoestring, so just the ability to have enough money coming in to be able to resource one or two full-time project managers uh, um, on the 24K a year would be, uh, is one of our big objectives. But the long-term objectives are essentially huge, right? Because as soon as you start saying, oh, we need to think about cladding, and we need to think about the thing that need about the system, what we're actually collectively doing, us, and OSC and all the other open hardware projects standing out right now, collectively, we're not, you know, we're not necessarily organized because we've got a kind of shared idea. What we're making is Wikipedia for stuff, right? There's loads of really complex stuff behind that, but fundamentally, that's an amazing idea, right? To say, if the state and the market are failing in their ability to, to, to deliver on that right to consume, that we can actually democratize the right to produce. Um, Putting low cost solutions to and high performance solutions and things like to things like off grid energy, off grid sanitation, and so forth, get them into get them into the commons. And the great empowering thing about this is that although you don't sleep for a while, actually what happens is you know only one person needs to do it once and then it's there forever, which is great, but it's a pretty rewarding way to go about trying to do social projects as someone who's been involved in kind of social architecture projects frustratedly. Um, and so this is one of, the, of those that we're working on, which is um, essentially passive house, really high energy performance windows, which we're trying to make it possible to print out and make for under £200, and half of that is just blazing cost. That's our target. So, but I want to finish by standing here naked <coughs> and say, actually, here are our problems. Um, here are the problems which I suspect all the other open hardware projects are experiencing right now. First one is open is not free, right? Um, We've got to find ways of building funding resource models around this just to, be able to allow us to take money off the table and to allow others to do so. Second one, again, we've talked about before, sharing platforms, understanding the stock infrastructure. Where is GitHub for stuff? Well, we're kind of some people we work with who are actually working on this stuff, but it's really, really interesting. Um, governance and ownership. Seeing a lot of open hardware projects run into difficulties because sovereignty and stuff isn't dealt with. You can't monetize something that someone else has engaged with as a social altruistic or, or something else norm. So um, immediate things start breaking around governance and ownership. So what we're trying to do is actually to, to set up an organization which um, takes ownership off the table actually. So that all the assets will be held by the foundation to create an open market through which to do work. Because actually open hardware you can sell it's actually I think potentially easier to build business models around open software because you can sell goods and services. But actually you've got to there's monopolies there. And just by the fact that I'm standing here, going around and standing on stage, might create a kind of cultural monopoly, as well as a, as a kind of legal monopoly. And that, we have to resist that. So that also connects with something about how we, how we actually host open peer-to-peer -peer markets um, over and above the platform. The second one is, uh, sorry, the third one is, is legal liability, which we've already talked about. And um, <coughs> yeah, that's a, a kind of big issue. Too much fun doing it. Um, and the final one is, is this going back to where I started around industrial revolutions, which is, yeah, technology is the answer to what's the question that Sergio Price said, which is actually all this stuff around organ web forming organization, we're getting really developed at that because it's been going along, you know, on a long time. Hardware is perhaps now coming in and it's been going on for maybe a few years, five, ten years. Um, what we need to remember though is that the disruptions come always when you're being really hard nosed about lowering the thresholds, the social thresholds, the time, cost, skill, carbon, I would say fundamentally the four, the four big thresholds. And if we can find ways to design them down, then we're actually at least have a chance of being disruptive. Thanks very much.
Hey, hey, same shit. Same shit. Same shit. <laughs> hey, um, great stuff. How, um, when do you want to make it bigger? So if I want to build a wiki, you know, platform house, uh, how, you know, how does it scale? Uh, it scales a lot different ways. Scaling would probably be scaling literally, as in making it house as big. Anyone can have a crack at that now, but you're going to need to get engineers on board. It's the system we're working with. They will say, well, we're going to do certain, for example, our max room span is going to be six meters. Okay, keep that stuff over there. Like so, um, in terms of how it scales, right, and this is the important thing, kind of where we're at right now, which is, yeah, you know, open source software, they, they happen more slowly than you think, but then they kick off. One of the problems is that media work really fast, so the story gets out really quickly. And then it's about actually the community sort of organizing to a certain level. So, we're at that stage where we're just actually, to host that micro market, what we're actually doing is putting some open democratic charters out there. So, people can kind of where we're at, so they know that we're not going to be running off and you know, owning this. Um, so in a way, that's kind of setting the thing. Actually, the reality is, uh, in terms of scale, we've got a roadmap planned out for what we'd like to do next, and it's kind of open to anyone to do anything. It's kind of well planned. We know exactly where we, we could go in terms of parametrics, design automation, so and so forth. Our limitations are um, realistically uh, financial resources knowledge would really, really hot on stuff like that. So I think that there will be a certain, we know there are a few certain tipping points on our stands. The first, that minimal viable product is a key one, and particularly the first proof of a house to say, this works, it costs this much, it doesn't leak, you know, we got it certified. That is the key first tipping point. At that point, it'll scale to maybe, uh, you know, 10 houses a year for a year. That would be epic for us. So, and then after that, then we'll start we can start talking about 100,000. I think it's going to be the last question because. Uh, yeah, do you have legal issues just as uh, yeah. OSE had? Yeah, pretty soon. Just one of those, yeah, I put that in there with the liability thing, which is, yeah, open software, open software breaks people lose time and money, but when hardware breaks, they lose limbs. Um, uh, basically, that is all ongoing. The way, strangely, it works. Um, at the moment is actually we're just back back loading. Architecture on the existing legislation. Architecture is, is actually useful in the sense that it was too rubbish to ever properly industrialise in the first place. So all of the certifications are happens case by case in a lot of ways anyway. So when we're making these commission projects, we're just going through the normal process of building regulations and, and so on and so forth um, to get those things certified. But long run we've got to start getting really, really interested in how you can build some degree of Port that fungible certification through the system. And planning, of course, is another big one. So, can we start getting open data around planning frameworks in different locations and built into the platform um, with design automation around it? Um, the, I think there's a really interesting issue around this whole issue, of, which we were talking about, uh, Jack, Jack Rob, in the previous thing, which is you know, fair use, which is if I sell you something, sure, we have to have to professionals, we have to build the normal guarantees around that. Um, that's hard, but even harder is this thing about uh, giving away. Now, in theory, you have fair use anyway, so if you wanted to, you could go and make one of these at home and use it yourself. It turns out, as I, as I understand it, and I'm not very deeply knowledgeable, I'm, and we're see, something we're really actively doing is connecting with kind of open source legal thinkers on this stuff, because this is a big issue for all open hardware projects, um, is that actually it's not so clear cut as. Um, Oh, it's your responsibility. Because if you do something, you have natural moral obligations. So there's, there's, whether that can financially come back to is one thing, but if somebody actually dies in one of these things, um, it's a real, real problem. So it's one of the issues we're, we're really going to have to be addressing big size. Not to solve it, but to scale it.